Hey yo, to the ladies, to the gentlemen, to them fellas, 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 what's going on? Welcome back to the channel, to the podcast. As I record this, and by the time it's released tomorrow, it's going to be football week. It's going to be Sunday. We got like four days until football starts. You got to get your drafts done. I got a draft Monday night. I got a draft two drafts Tuesday night. And I got a draft Wednesday night. We're hammering home the drafts as the cuts are going to be getting made and finished up today and tomorrow. I'm recording this on Saturday right now. September 5th, 2020. If you're watching this in the past, if you're watching this in the future, that's pretty crazy. You might be an alien. And then I don't think there's any way you're watching this in the past. So whenever you're watching this, obviously you can watch it on Sunday, on Monday and Tuesday, whenever you got to do your draft, we're going to be going down through the wide receiver tiers. And I'm not going to go through all 110 guys that I have in my rankings, but I'll go through the top 50. Now the running back video just came out yesterday. So you can check that one out. And again, all the rankings tiers, top 150s updated, especially because there's going to be a lot of cuts this weekend. Lamar Miller guys are getting cut today. Not that they really impact much things, but I'm sure there's going to be something that will all that stuff will be updated. I'm doing daily updates right now in the Supreme Draft Guide. Link down below. And because of the logo up above on the YouTube channel, at least, Monkey Knife Fight, they're sponsoring that bad boy for just $10 Ruskies. It's all linked down below to see how you can get it. If you want to dominate your draft, you got to be more informed than the other schmucks in your league. If you want to beat those schmucks, Supreme Draft Guide, link down below is going to help you do just that. So why don't we get this bad boy popped off? We'll go through like the top five or six tiers. I think it's like my top 50 wide receivers. We'll go down through them, talk about them like we did for the running backs yesterday. And if you could, if you could, please, please, we just crushed through 25,000 subscribers. Like button for me. This is the biggest time of the year for my channel. Everybody's eyes are on the football season, and these months are going to be pivotal for me to hit that next level. It's just me here. So if you could, subscribe button. Big little one on the screen. You want to know what that does for me? It's totally free for you. It allows me to reach more people. It allows me to get this content out there more because third party advertisers, whatever it might be, want to sponsor the channel. And then bam, it makes sense for me to be doing this other than going out and working somewhere else. So thank you so much for allowing me to do this. You all rock. Get yourself all relaxed right now. Buckle up. Get your big energy out right now. That's what that logo is up above. The lightning bolt is our big energy here. That's what we're coming in with. Please do relax, chill out, crack your neck, buckle up, take your shoes off and sit back. Here we go. Let's start it off right now with our tier one of wide receivers. It's going to be Michael Thomas. And I'm going to vocalize these a little bit because of the podcast version, but Michael Thomas, Devonte Adams, and Julio Jones are in my tier one. At points this offseason, I had Michael Thomas number two and Devonte Adams number one. Now, I guess it's the safer choice to be putting just like it is Christian McCaffrey as your number one running back. But I do think that the upside for Devonte Adams to see a record setting like 200 target type season, right? The red zone targets that he'll probably see. Leading the league last year in red zone percentage of upwards of almost 40% of the Packers targets were to Devontae Adams in the red zone. It was around 38%. Absolutely ridiculous, right? If Devontae Adams doesn't deal with a big injury last year, he's probably pushing a little bit higher up into the top 12 picks overall where he falls off into the second round. He's probably pushing Michael Thomas a little bit more for the number one wide receiver spot. Now, again, I'll, I'll call out that these are PPR rankings and tiers that we're seeing. So it's Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, and Julio Jones. I mean, what are you going to take away from Julio Jones? Calvin Ridley is, of course, there. Calvin Ridley might take touchdowns away, but he's never really been Julio's things. But Julio is going to continue to see the yards where he led the league in receiving last year yet again as a 30 plus year old wide receiver. He's also going to probably lead this team and be up there in the top five, definitely top 10 in targets as long as he's healthy. Now imagine, and we've been saying this every single year, except like one in his career where he had like six or seven touchdowns. Imagine if Julio's touchdowns actually finally come through, right? Maybe Todd Gurley in the red zone takes some guys more down into the box if he could actually be a red zone threat like he was with the Rams scoring double digit touchdowns like every single year that he was healthy there. Imagine if Julio Jones goes for eight to 10 touchdowns. It's just wide receiver one, right? He's going to have to be the wide receiver one. You can currently get Julio Jones in the second round of drafts. He's my number three overall receiver. Those are my top tier, my tier one wide receivers, Michael Thomas, Devonta Adams, Julio Jones. Probably not going to shock you all that much. I'll scroll up a little bit more now so you can see the tier two of wide receivers, which might start to actually shock you, especially if you're just getting back into the swing of things right now. And it's going to start off with my wide receiver four, Tyree Kill, wide receiver five, Kenny Galladay, six, Allen Robinson, seven, Chris Goblin, and all the way down at wide receiver eight, DeAndre Hopkins. Those five wide receivers make up my wide receiver two, my tier two. Now, Tyree Kill at the four, I think that's pretty obvious why. Number one offense, as long as he stays healthy and doesn't get suspended and all these things, he's going to be right up there, right? And last year, you actually really got to see Tyree take another step forward in his game. Everybody knows him as the guy who's just going to run behind your safeties and your secondary and score deep touchdowns probably four to five times a year. Last year, he really worked on his short passing game clinic. I mean, the game that he came back against the Titans, he was putting on a clinic, both of his touchdowns, short passing touchdowns. He was picking up first downs and yards after contact and the catch. Tyreek Hill last year took that next step forward for a wide receiver of not just this, this Z wide receiver or the guy on the outside who's just going to go and really move into the slot now and run these seam routes up the middle of the field and just be the fastest guy. He could still do that, but now his route running has gotten much more crisp. And that's going to be something that's fantastic when your quarterback is Patrick Mahomes in this Andy Reid Chiefs offense. I got Kenny Galladay at five. Look, he finished here last year. Kenny Galladay was a borderline top five receiver, and that's right where he was with half of his games not being with Matthew Stafford, being with Jeff Driscoll and being with David Blau. Now, Matthew Stafford, who was pacing to be the number two quarterback in fantasy football behind Jameis Winston last year and the number one passing touchdown quarterback, he would have finished two ahead of Lamar Jackson if he kept his 
his pace up for the second half of the season, it's healthy, right? Stafford's healthy. Yes, Marvin Jones is still out there. He's always going to be a touchdown monster. But Kenny Galladay is something else. One of the best contested catch players in the entire league and one of the best overall end zone weapons in the entire league, seeing the most end zone targets last year. Got Allen Robinson at six. They're saying Mitch Trubisky is going to start the season off. We'll see how long he keeps that job. It just seems inevitable that Nick Foles is going to push him if Trubisky struggles. But here's the good thing. If Trubisky struggles, you get Nick Foles in there and we assume Nick Foles is going to be at least a better quarterback. If, if Mr. Trubisky stays the starter, it probably means he's playing well, right? It probably means he's doing well. And if that's the case, Allen Robinson is probably playing well as well. 150 plus targets he saw last year, only one of five receivers to do that. I haven't projected for right around 140 targets this year, which is going to be a top 10 overall. He's one of the most underappreciated wide receivers in the entire league, if not the most underappreciated player in the entire league on offense. So yes, Allen Robinson is a top six guy for me. Goblin at seven. I do prefer Goblin to Evans. You get Goblin playing this plus size slot role still, maybe a Julian Edelman plus now, especially going down the field a little bit more on the inside of the field. I do like that. He always gets the better matchups, right? He's a big slot receiver who's going to be going up against the other teams. At best, their second cornerback and in more times than not their third best cornerback since most good cornerbacks don't like playing in the slot because it's a disadvantage for a defender. The wide receiver can use the entire field, right? He can go left, he can go right, he can juke, he can go straight up the middle. Whereas on the outsides, that sideline is another defender which helps those outside cornerbacks. That's why you normally don't see good cornerbacks in the slot because it's got hard to be a good cornerback in the slot. The last one was Chris Harris from the Denver Broncos. And when you don't know what he did, he moved to the outside. And at the bottom of my tier two, DeAndre Hopkins eight overall. Look, DeAndre Hopkins is not somebody I'm drafting at all this year, unless he falls into like the third round, but I'm not taking him ever in the second round. He's moving teams. He's not going to see 150 plus targets like he did with every year Deshaun Watson. Shout out to Deshaun Watson, just getting 40 mil or $39 million a year. Absolutely insane. But now he's moving teams to a team last year that saw two wide receivers see 100 plus targets and Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk. Even if you give Larry Fitzgerald 80 targets this year, which seems more than reasonable, Christian Kirk, I'm giving over 110 targets. Just where are the targets coming from? This team's not going to throw 680 times. At least you can't project them for that, right? So when there's other guys on this field that are going to see targets as well, whether it's Kenyon Drake out of the backfield, whether it's four wide receiver sets with Andy Isabella, the second year player who had high upside last year, Hopkins comes in and sure, he could see 125 and 130 targets. But if that's the case, he's no longer a top five wide receiver. And for me, he's my wide receiver eight right now. The red zone threat will always be there, but there has not been a lot of time to gain chemistry and he's overall going to see his volume go down. And the stickiest stat that you have for wide receivers is volume, their targets, their usage. Once that starts to go down, everything else is just naturally going to go down as well. So let's get into now our tier three. So we're going to scroll through tier three real quickly for you. And it's a pretty big tier. It goes from my wide receiver nine, and it's going to go all the way down to my wide receiver 20. So a lot of guys in this tier. And in the first five are going to be Odell, Mike Evans, DJ Moore, Robert Woods, and Adam Thielen. I like Odell a lot more this year. There's going to be more play action with Kevin Skafanski coming over from Minnesota. Baker Mayfield's best quality last year was play action. Odell last year led the league in drops. I don't expect that to happen again. Odell last year also played the entire season with a sports hernia that he had surgery on back in January, I believe. So he's actually healthy this year. I, I expect a lot of things to regress in a positive direction for him. And now you're going to have Baker Mayfield behind the best offensive line he's had now in three years as a pro as last year's was borderline, if not the worst right there with the Rams, maybe bottom two, bottom three in the entire league. They improved the offensive line through the draft, through free agency, adding Jack Conklin. Play action passing is going to be thriving for Odell on the outside. He is a top 10 wide receiver for me now. I won't talk about all 50 receivers, but DJ Moore is going to crack into my top 12. But Teddy Bridgewater is there. He's not a good quarterback. He's one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the league. And he was throwing accurate in the intermediate last year. And now DJ Moore is going to be a guy who's getting the most separation last year and one of the best contested catch players. And he was also running great slants, short, medium, and deep routes for DJ Moore are some of the best in the league. So I think this is a perfect combination with an accurate quarterback in Teddy Bridgewater. You can see some Michael Thomas type production between Drew Brees and Michael Thomas when you have an accurate quarterback throwing to an efficient receiver in the short and intermediate range. That's exactly what you have now in Teddy Bridgewater and DJ Moore in terms of the skill set and the skill meshes. I've been high on Robert Woods all year. If he sees the touchdowns similar to Julio Jones, he's going to easily be a top 10 wide receiver. He's going to continue to see 125 to I have him right now over 130 targets in this Rams offense as the number one wide receiver. I love it a lot. He's going to be out there in two wide receiver sets a ton like he was towards the final five or six weeks last year playing 95 plus percent of the snaps, whereas Cooper Cup snaps were going down as he struggled on the outside. Like I said, Adam Thielen is 13th overall. Nothing bad to say about him. No more digs. I like him on the outside. It seems like right now, Busy Johnson is going to beat out the rookie out of LSU and Justin Jefferson from the number two job. Busy Johnson, the second year player after being a rookie and struggling a lot last year where he transitioned from the slot to the outside. Seems like he had a really good camp, but Thielen is still the clear number one on that offense. Gets a nice week one matchup where he'll probably move into the slot against the Packers and avoid Jair Alexander. Then you get 14, 15, 16, and 17 are Juju, Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley, and Cooper Cup. I will say that I'm lower than most on Calvin Ridley. A lot of people want to put him in their top 10 or borderline top 12. I'm close to taking him outside my top 20 right now. I, I get it. He's great, but Julio Jones is still there. 
I don't think he's going to surpass Julio Jones. If he does, he's going to have to do it through the touchdowns. And if Calvin Ridley has a 12 touchdown season, well, then you throw your cards up in the air because if any of these wide receivers rank from number one to like number 20, have a 12 or 14 touchdown season, odds are they're finishing as a top five receiver, right? Like you can make that argument for any of them at that point, but he's not going to out target Julio Jones if he's healthy. He's not going to out receive in terms of overall yardage and probably not even receptions Julio Jones at this point. When you can't do that and you have now a tight end coming in who's very athletic, more athletic than Austin Hooper and Hayden Hurst, right? When you have a pass catching running back who since Devonta Freeman in the past few years has been banged up and losing efficiency because of that. Now you have Todd Gurley, who is a good pass catching running back to say what you want about him. He looks healthy. All the reports out of camp is that he looks dynamic. It's a lot harder for a guy in Calvin Ridley to hit this top 10 ceiling. So I've met 16 overall. I think it's an appropriate range. As we scroll down a little bit more to 18, 19, and 20, it is going to be Tyler Lockett, Keenan Allen, and AJ Brown. So I like all these guys. Keenan Allen is going way too late into drafts. He's falling into the fifth, sixth round sometimes. I got him in the sixth round the other day. If I get that in some of my home leagues this week, I'm going to feel very, very good. Tyler Lockett at 18, he was dealing with an injury for about four to six weeks last year, and he still finished as one of the best wide receivers in the league. If you look at Tyler Lockett's stats from the final six weeks last year, not including the playoffs, finishes as a top five wide receiver in terms of efficiency and usage overall. And AJ Brown is 20th overall. AJ Brown's one of the guys who can take this next step forward. I'm betting this year, not on the running game. Uh, last year, the Titans were one of the best overall offenses, number two in overall efficiency, the number one quarterback in efficiency, one of the number one wide receivers in AJ Brown, one of the best tight ends in efficiency in John Smith, and obviously the leading rusher in Derrick Henry. So they were very efficient offense. Well, if the efficiency drops now because of the play action passing being so good, the yards per attempt from Ryan Tannehill, and now the efficiency is dropping. So the volume picks up on offense and they have to pass a little bit more and their defense definitely outproduced expectations last year, finishing top 10 when they were not expected to finish that high, a very good defense. If that drops a little bit more now to baseline expectations, well, your defense is getting worse. So now you have to throw a little bit more. And if you're not as efficient throwing because you were mega efficient last year, you have to throw even more than that. And I'm banking on the overall offense to take a step forward. That's why I don't really like Derrick Henry as much this year. In non-PPR, he looks fine. But that's why I really, really like John Smith and really like AJ Brown right now, a top 20 wide receiver for me. Tier four is where I really, uh, pretty much right around Asia Brown is where I start to really love these receivers. And honestly, I try and get two running backs early, maybe three sometimes, and then just load up on these tier four, bottom of tier three wide receivers. Let's get into tier four right now. As you can see on the screen, it's also another pretty big tier. It starts off with my wide receiver 21, DK Metcalf. I love this tier of three guys. Pretty much Asia Brown at my wide receiver 20 to end out tier three. And the start of tier four might be my four favorite wide receivers at, at value pretty much everywhere. DK Metcalf at 21, 22 DJ Shark, and 23 Terry McLaurin. The Jaguars are going to suck. They're going to have to play from behind a lot, whether it's Gardner Minshew or somebody else. I think it's going to be Minshew. He was very good last year. His mobility keeps plays and drives alive. And DJ Shark was one of the best receivers last year towards the middle of the season. A little bit of a banged up injury kind of limited his second half of the season explosion. Terry McLaurin is just a breakout. He was the breakout rookie, barely misses a thousand yards where AJ Brown, the rookie got a thousand yards. So it's all these second year guys, DJ Shark being a third year player that I like a lot. You could throw Michael Gallup into this bucket as well. I have him a little bit later on ranked. McLaurin, I like a lot. Everything out of camp has been that Dwayne Haskins looks good. Steve Sims is the only other weapon there. They're cutting players around him right now. They just cut Trey Quinn. You have Kelvin Harmon hurt. Cam Sims is a potential cut threat. Maybe by the time you're watching this, he can get cut. They're pretty much saying, we don't need any of you. They didn't re-sign Jordan Reed. He goes to San Francisco, right? They, they ended up getting rid of Adrian Peterson and Darius guys. This offense right now, the playmakers in it are Terry McLaurin, Steve Sims, and Antonio Gibson. It's two second year players and a rookie running back slash wide receiver hybrid in Antonio Gibson. So Terry McLaurin was a stud last year who broke out as a rookie. First month of the season, just dominating so many secondaries, including good secondaries where Byron Jones was with the Cowboys at that point last year. So I like McLaurin a lot. One of my favorite picks in the draft wide receiver 24, 25 and 26, Stefan Diggs, Cortland Sutton and T.Y. Hilton. I don't normally find myself drafting any of these guys. Sometimes if Stefan Diggs falls to the sixth round, I end up taking him there, but Sutton is the clear alpha in Denver, right? Especially with KJ Hamler getting a little bit banged up. He's there with a bunch of second year players and just really rookies for the most part in KJ Hamler when he's healthy and Jerry Judy and Albert O, Noah Fant, a second year player. So Sutton now the third year stud in this offense. I do think that he has a lot of upside. I'm not saying there's too many fouls. No, I think that he is the mouth to feed out there, but you do have pass catching running backs in Lindsay and Melvin Gordon. And I think that I just don't trust Drew Locke all that much right now. So I'm not getting there as much, but he's still a top 25, 25 exactly wide receiver for me. I'll scroll down a little bit more. As you can see, this is a huge tier because I think a lot of these guys are separated by not that much of my projections. So in tier four wide receiver, it starts at 21 with DK Metcalf. Let's start to go down to 27 to 30. And I'll scroll down a little bit. You can see how big tier four is. It's about 20 players. It's 15 to be exact. So you can see at 27, I have Devante Parker and I'll scroll up a little bit more so you can see the rest of them. 27, I have Devontae Parker, 28, AJ Green, Landry, 29, and Will Fuller, 30. I think Will Fuller can potentially be a top 10 wide receiver. I don't ever think Will Fuller is going to land at 30 overall if he stays healthy the whole year. I'm kind of banking in a little bit of an injury because he's never stayed healthy for an entire season. If Will Fuller plays 16 games. He's probably a top 15, if not top 10 wide receiver and a number one offense for the man who just got paid the money man himself now into Sean Watson. Will Fuller is this guy who has explosion. Last year, he was showing just the short routes as well, but he's always that deep threat weapon take the top off of a defense. This is sort of your safe range when you're drafting guys like Devontae Parker. AJ Green, to an extent, people don't want to be as high on him. 
ranking him outside their top 35. I'm a little bit higher on AJ Green right now. He looks healthy. He looks to be the number one still. He still has all the explosiveness. They're saying the hamstring looks good. Uh, obviously not the same explosiveness from three or two years ago. Obviously he takes a step down now that he's a little bit older and, and approaching 32 years of age at this point, uh, but I still have him ranked as a top 30 receiver. And to finish out tier four, you have number 31, Julian Edelman, 32, Brandon Cooks, 33, Christian Kirk from very high on, 34, Hollywood Brown, 35, Marvin Jones, and 36, Michael Gallup. Now in seeing this, you might think that I'm lower on Michael Gallup. I just don't know how to get him higher up. I mean, I could take Michael Gallup. I could put him over guys like Marvin Jones and Christian Kirk and Brandon Cooks, but they're all so close. Like if Michael Gallup scores an extra touchdown this year and he scores one more than my projection that I have for him at like six or seven, and he scores one more than that. Well, then Michael Gallup's going to jump to like my wide receiver 24. That's how close all these guys are instead of being like my wide receiver 36. So it's almost marginal at this point, but I do have Christian Kirk at 33. A lot of people have him as like 40, 42 so far back. Tell me the difference. What's the big difference between Christian Kirk and Calvin Ridley? Calvin Ridley scores more touchdowns. Okay. I mean, that's fine. They're coming into their third years. They both broke out and missed about a month of the season last year due to injury. And they broke out really their, their first season for the most part. Calvin Ridley, obviously scoring so many touchdowns, like six in his first four or five games as a rookie, but they both have studs in front of them. Although Calvin Ridley is coming from a different team in DeAndre Hopkins and maybe takes a little bit of time to acclimate himself. Whereas Julio Jones is going to continue to put up 1300 plus yards. It seems this year, right? A ton of targets, top five in that department. And Christian Kirk already has that built-in connection with Calvin Murray from last year. I mean, I obviously have Calvin Ridley ranked higher, but I don't think the gap is as big as people think it is. I'm very high on Calvin Ridley this year. Hollywood Brown at 34. A lot of people want to be high on him, but it's just a passing offense. I don't think they're going to throw enough. I don't think they're going to throw that much. I know that he put on like 20 pounds this offseason. He still is very small, even for putting on all that weight. Now we're about to get into tier five. We'll go through my top 50 wide receivers at that point. Maybe we'll go a little bit longer since we're getting through this a little bit quickly, but please do as we continue to go hit that like button for me. That really, really, really does help out a ton. Subscribe button pops up on the screen. If you want to see all of my positions, tiers, rankings, top 150s, they're going to be updated later later today and tomorrow. So these won't stay exactly the same, but relatively the same. And have those sheets up to you next to you when you're drafting and in preparation with all the player profiles and key stats databases, please do down below in the description for just $10 Ruskies. Thanks to Monkey Knife Fight is the Supreme Draft Guide. You can check it out, see how you can get the offer. If you're not eligible anymore for the offer because of the time you're watching this or the place that you're living in, there is another option for you to get the draft guide linked down below in the description. I appreciate all of you guys a ton. It really, really is awesome to be doing this. And again, the football season is here. The big energy, if you can feel it right now, smash the like and subscribe button. Thank you very much. With that said, let's get into now tier five. Tier five is going to start off with wide receiver 37, who I'm very high on and want to continue to move him up my board. This Sean Jackson, the number one receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles for the past couple of months. And now it looks even better for him. Marquise Goodwin opted out, right? He opts out for a trade in the draft from the San Francisco 49ers. Fast guy probably would have been the backup to Sean Jackson. He opts out. You end up getting now injuries to a couple of players. The main injury, Alshon Jeffrey, not starting the season. The rookie, Jalen Rieger, is going to miss probably at least a month. And for a rookie, that sets you back way more than a month. He's undraftable for me right now at this point, because people who are drafting Jalen Rieger are going to drop him in two to three weeks, and then he can just pick him up for free at that point. Do not draft him. It's a waste of your absolute time and your overall roster spots and your draft capital. But Deshaun Jackson on the outside right now, everything in camp, speed, speed lives, right? Speed kills. It lives longer. If, if that's your skill set, if it's not being a bruiser in this big body receiver, you can play into your thirties like Deshaun Jackson is. He looks good. Everybody's saying he looks good. It's going to be the two tight end like it was last year, but now you at least have Deshaun Jackson on the outside and send us some of the awful wide receivers like Matt Collins that they were using on the outside last year. Man was targeted and was running like 99% of the snaps and only had like one catch in four weeks. Absolutely brutal. And then we get into kind of this murky range. Crowder at 38 is going to have a lot of targets secured for him. A lot of Jets receivers banged up right now. Rookie Denzel Mims, Perriman, these guys are banged up. Mims returns to practice, but he is still a rookie. Crowder in the slot, Herndon in the middle of the field, shouldn't control a lot of that offense. And then you get Debo Samuel at number 40. He should continue to move up my boards. It seems like he's going to be ready for week two. And they said he might be ready for week one. His recovery from this Jones fracture is a 10 week recovery. He's right on track for that and actually progressing about two weeks ahead of schedule. If that's the case and he's actually healthy, he's not the wide receiver 40. He starts to become like the wide receiver 30 or 31. So you can currently get Debo Samuel in like rounds eight through 10 in a lot of your drafts. Go ahead and smash that button. I'm not scared taking him in round seven or six at this point, because it seems like he's going to be fully healthy by week two and potentially by the start of the season in a week away. I'm lower on Tyler Boyd than a lot of people. I like the skill set of Tyler Boyd. He's just a true number two wide receiver. If AJ Green is definitely going to come back and be out there and they have a lot of depth everywhere else, right? Yes, Tyler Boyd can take over the slot, but they still have John Ross. They obviously just signed Joe Mixon to a bigger contract. I think he's going to be used more in the passing game. They have a T Higgins who they took with the first pick in the second round overall in the NFL draft, the virtual draft of 2020. They still have Auden Tate out there. They have so many weapons and AJ Green is a number one and Tyler Boyd is a fine number two. And that's why I have him ranked right now as a wide receiver 41 overall as a number two in your offense. I can't put him any higher. All these other guys are borderline number ones or have the opportunity to be number ones uh, in their offenses. Deshaun Jackson, 
Crowder, Deontay Johnson, Debo Samuel, all those guys, right? So he's just going to stay at 41 right now for me. And my wide receiver 42 in tier five is going to be John Brown. Honestly, John Brown, I don't know if it's you guys too, but he's the one player like this entire year in the draft that I just look at and I go, yep, that's John Brown. Like literally does nothing for me. I don't hate him. I don't like him where he's going right now. It's just fine. Last year, I loved him a lot based on being the number one in Buffalo and it really paid off. He was running clean routes everywhere, not just a deep threat. It's going to be interesting wide receiver core uh, this year with John Brown out there, but I just don't know what to do with the guy. And then we get down a little bit more to now guys who are wide receiver twos in their offenses and maybe not the greatest offense offenses, but very talented players in Preston Williams, Anthony Miller, Darius Slayton, Sterling Shepard, depending on who's the wide receivers there. These guys are my wide receivers, 43 to 46. I currently like Darius Slayton a little bit more than Shepard just because he has the higher upside, right? Shepard, if he's going to play on the outside and he seems like he's going to with Golden Tate playing in the slot, it seemed like Shepard has not played well on the outside at all when he's actually healthy. He plays a lot better in the slot. That's where Daniel Jones threw a ton to last year in the slot. And that's where Shepard has really thrived in his NFL careers in the slot. So now Golden Tate, I assume is going to continue to be in the slot as a primary slot receiver, which Slayton and Shepard on the outside. I'll just bank on the big playability and rather have the bigger, higher upside, sexier option, second year player Darius Slayton ahead of him. I like Anthony Miller and Preston Williams. Nothing against either of them. Preston Williams was the number one receiver in the Dolphins offense. Everybody remembers Devontae Parker balling out last year as like a top 10 wide receiver, but it was actually Preston Williams who was number one eight weeks into the season until he suffered his ACL tear, which he has made a very, very quick and almost remarkable recovery from as a rookie coming into his second year. To close out some of tier five as we scroll down, is going to be a couple of rookies down here. 47. Wide receiver 47 is Henry rugs 48 second year player a big letdown Nikhil Harry first round pick last year in the 2019 draft for the New England Patriots and then 49 overall is CD Lamb to close out tier five so I'll scroll up a little bit I like CD Lamb he's obviously the wide receiver three he'll be competing in the middle of the field right now with Blake Jarwin but they're going to have a lot of offense they're going to score a lot of touchdowns on this offense mega upside comes if Amari Cooper who normally deals with some sort of injuries and Michael Gallup who has dealt with injuries as recent as last year miss a couple of games that's where CD Lamb starts to become the number one or number two option in this offense so yes CD Lamb uh in my opinion, the best wide receiver in this past draft from 2020 looks pretty good. Nikhil Harry, I can take it or leave it. Uh, some days he looks really good at practice. Some days he doesn't. He is going to have the option to be the number one outside receiver with Edelman in the slot for Cam Newton. They're saying that Nikhil Harry and Cam Newton's connection has been clicking towards the end of camp. So if he's going to be a number one outside receiver for an offense and maybe that number one touchdown threat, I'll take some risks as a top 50 or a borderline top 50 wide receiver. And Henry Ruggs keeps moving up my board. Tyra Williams it seems like he's going to be done now. Brian Edwards on the outside. Henry Ruggs are saying they're going to put into the slot. If you have somebody with the skill set of Henry Ruggs, not only running deep routes, but now getting moved into the slot, almost like a Tyree Kill does, the sky is the limit. Derek Carr has been improving the past three years of his career. Yes, he has with accuracy in all these other areas. So I think the situation is actually a lot better than people think. They just don't like Derek Carr because he's not sexy and the Raiders continue to suck. But Derek Carr has gotten the job done. He has sustained guys like Amari Cooper and even Michael Gallup as top tier wide receivers in the NFL. And it looks like Henry Ruggs is going to have every opportunity to do that right out of the gate. The number one wide receiver taken in the 2020 draft by John Gruden and these Oakland Raiders. So while we're here, we might as well scroll a little bit more, do a little bit more bonus. We're only at about 20 something minutes right now, but we'll go into tier six. I'll just show you the top of tier six at this point. It starts with my wide receiver 50. There you go. All tier six wide receiver 50 to 58. The rest of them you can get in the Supreme draft guide linked down below if you would, but here we go. Michael Pittman at 50. I'm pretty bullish on Michael Pittman. A lot of people have him around wide receiver 55 or wide receiver 60. Again, T.Y. Hilton's out there. Paris Campbell has a lot of upside. They're saying about his camp. He's going to be in the slot for the Colts, but Philip Rivers has always liked his big wide receivers on the outside, whether it's dating back to Vincent Jackson, who he had just a historic run with almost right. At least for the just as a team, whether it's Mike Williams the past couple of years, either having a lot of touchdowns or a thousand yards last year, being one of the best yards per reception guys. And now it could potentially be Michael Pittman, who's just had a fine camp, nothing standing out, but nothing bad from him. And then some other guys down here, Sammy Watkins in a high power chiefs offense, Alan Lazard. I'm liking a lot more at wide receiver 52. I'm continuing to like him. He had a good camp. He's a wide receiver two right now, pretty firmly and positive things are being said from Aaron Rodgers all camp long about Alan Lazard, who finished the season off as a top 20 wide receiver last year in week 17. Nicole Hardman at 53. Look, if Nicole Hardman, if you told me he was going to play and play ahead of Demarcus Robinson or play ahead of Sammy Watkins. Yeah, he'd be like a top 25 or a top 30 wide receiver. But right now he's the wide receiver four in his offense. And if you factor in Travis Kelsey, obviously as a pass catcher, he's the wide receiver five. And if you factor in the guy in Clyde Edwards Hilaire catching balls out of the backfield, maybe four or five targets a game, five or six, really, if you look at last year's numbers for Chiefs running back, seeing 6.6 targets per game. Well, now you end up seeing McCall Harmon as like the seventh passing option. Now, obviously, when he's on the field, he'll be ahead of some of those guys who aren't on the field. But you currently have Tyreek, Sammy Watkins, you have Travis Kelsey, you have Clyde Edwards Hilaire, and you also have Demarcus Robinson and who they re-signed. So it does hurt McCall Harmon. He's up here only because of the upside that he does have. If he can jump one of them or one of those guys gets injured, Emmanuel Sanders is going to be coming into the middle of the field. Saints have needed a number two wide receiver for a while. Ted Ginn hasn't gotten it done all that much in consistency and health. Uh, Traquan Smith, third year player now really hasn't done all that much. It seems like Emmanuel Sanders is going to fit that role as the second receiver in the slot in the middle of the field. And then some exciting rookies and, and second year player, Steve Sims. So 55 is LaVisca Chenault. I like him a lot. I think he sees maybe a carry per game now that Leonard Fournette is out of there and this team just doesn't care at this 
point. He seems to be the wide receiver too, especially with D.D. Westbrook nursing an injury. Steve Sims jumped up a ton for me. Let me actually change this because he's on Washington, not Minnesota, but he jumped up a ton once Trey Quinn was cut. It seems like Steve Smith will now get a lot more slot usage. I want Steve Sims in the slot. It's fine if he goes to the outside, but I want him a lot more in the slot. Trey Quinn being cut opens up that opportunity and shows the confidence that they have in putting Steve Sims in the slot yet again, where he thrived the final month of the season last year. And then some rookies start to appear here. Uh, I believe it's Justin Jefferson, Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk's nursing a hamstring injury. Debo Samuel looks like he's coming back in time. So Brandon Ayuk behind George Kittle, who's also a little bit banged up behind Debo Samuel. He's like at best the number three receiving option in this offense. And then you start to get into tier seven where it starts with Denzel Mims and some other rookies. So that's where I'm right now. Those are my top six tiers. Those are my top 58 wide receivers. And screw it. We'll go even more bonus into tier seven, which these start to become really big tiers now. So I'll just show you the top of tier seven right here. You can look at it on the YouTube video. A lot of rookies, a lot of veterans changing teams, potentially a lot of slot receivers in this range. It starts off tier seven PPR rankings with my 59 overall wide receiver, Denzel Mims. And then we go right down from there from 60 on Jerry Judy, Curtis Samuel, Rashad Perriman, Robbie Anderson, Hunter Renfro, Golden Tate, Randall Cobb, all these guys, right? Brian Edwards is my wide receiver 67. Worth pointing out that Paris Campbell is my wide receiver 69. Very nice. And I think he has a lot of upside to outdo that number. A lot of positive things they're saying about the former, I believe, Ohio State player. Now that he has a nice big slot plus role, kind of like Chris Goblin has in the Tampa Bay Bucks offense. We'll see if Phil Rivers can take advantage of that. And I would say that the cheapest Giants wide receiver is my favorite in Golden Tate, my wide receiver 65 overall right now. I like him more than Sterling Shepard. I like him more than Slayton. Obviously, projection wise, I don't, but for the value, he's going to be in the slot where Daniel Jones targeted the most and was the most efficient last year targeting that spot. When Golden Tate was healthy, he was very productive playing out of the slot. Touchdowns, uh, big receiving yard games, double digit targets, big target share. So yes, Golden Tate will be my favorite New York Giant player to actually draft that's at the wide receiver position because you can get him so late. And I think he can honestly be the number one wide receiver right out of the gate, almost like he was pretty much every week that he was healthy last year. So that's where I'm at. That is our top seven tiers right now. I believe it goes down to like tier eight or tier nine. As you can see, it scrolls all the way down to like my wide receiver 75 if you're watching on YouTube in tier seven. If you want to get all these and have the access to them. Supreme Draft Guide is linked up down below. I appreciate all that. Just $10 Ruskies. Thanks to Monkey Knife Fight. Like button before you go. Tomorrow, Monday is going to start our DFS weekly content. We're going to have a video out pretty much every day. I'm going to be live streaming on Monday nights for Monday Night Football. Thursday nights for Thursday Night Football. The big contest for DFS. The big contest for viewership. And then Sunday morning before the game start, I'll be taking fantasy football questions for season long and DFS. You can reach out over there. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe button so you know and you are notified of when I go live. So thank you so much, everybody. Like and subscribe. And I would really, really like to try and get to 26,000 subscribers before the season starts on Thursday. I think we might be able to get there. We're only about six or 700 away. So thank you all so much. You all rock. I'll see you in the next one tomorrow, gang. It's going to be week one officially on Monday. I cannot wait. The big energy is here. See y'all soon. See you in the next one.